So the mark of the beast is serving man and his laws instead of God and his laws. Dogma means decree. And so God's dogma is his decrees, and man's dogma is their decrees, and they call it doctrines, but it's false doctrines such as um, the Council of Nicaea banded together to make up their own doctrines the same way as in King James Day, he banded together to make up his own doctrines, and they did that by changing the Word of God. That's how you do it. So the Council of Nicaea of 325 and the King James Bible of 1611 are perfect examples. And you might say, well, how so? Okay, well, we have some books out here today. And remember, this is the context of the Mark of the Beast. So we have the Thompson Chain Bible Companion. We have these books right here by Philip Schaeff. He, there's a few volume set. There's a bunch of them, but I only have volume one and volume two, which is the Antinicene and the Apostolic Christianity and the Apostolic, or I'm sorry, Antinicene Christianity, which means before the Nicene Council. I have the Interlinear Bible. I have the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. I have the Harvest of Hellenism by E by F. E. Peters, and I have Christianity through the centuries, a history of the Christian church, and I have a, another um, theological dictionary of the New Testament. So, okay, what we're going to start with is we're going to start in Psalm chapter 2. And it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, like Constantine and King James, they set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Yahweh, the, the Lord, shall have them in derision. Okay, so Yahweh is king. How do we know that? Because the Bible says so, over and over and over again. So right here, that's what Adam wanted. Added, Adam wanted to be king, and Adam couldn't be king. So the, um, the mark of the beast is that you follow man's laws instead of God's, because God says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And in Revelation it says, if they don't have the mark in their forehead and on their um, right hand, they can't buy and sell. So this is the mark of a believer right here. Okay, and then right here in Judges, hey, y'all keep it down in there. So in Judges, it says, And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you, because they were asking him to be king. All right, right here, and I'm sorry, that was in Judges chapter 8, verse 23. And the other one was Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, a minute ago. And this is First Samuel chapter 8, right here, God rebukes Eli because he's following his sons instead of him. So he says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chief of all the offerings of Israel, my people. And he goes on and on, and that's in 1 Samuel 2. And I just read to you verse 29. He's rebuking them for following his sons instead of him. And then right here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, he's telling them, because they asked for a king, all of them were begging him to make a king, and he says, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy, in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. And then he goes on to explain, because God tells him to, what the king will be like that they're going to get. And he's going to be like a Gentile king. And that's why 
Um, and that's why they wanted a king in the first place we see in 1 Samuel 12, because they saw this Gentile king and wanted a king like that. It says, and when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came out against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when, the, when Yahweh, your Elohim, was your king. And then in 17 it says, Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto Yahweh, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of Yahweh in asking you a king. So asking for a king is wickedness. You're supposed to be relying on God, not man. So, okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and flip over here so you can see that. So they wanted a king like nah Nahash, or Nakash, however you said that. So we're going to flip over here to Mark chapter 10, where God says, we're not going to have a setup like the Gentiles, but Jesus called to them and said unto them, you know, I have a cut on my hand there. You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. But so shall it not be among you means we won't have a Gentile king, like the king that they were asking Samuel to give them. And whosoever of you will, oh, sorry. Um, great among you shall be your minister. And that means a slave, a servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be slaved unto, but to slave and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's what a true Christian does. And we see that same thing over here in Peter. Peter already knows that they're starting to try to worship him. So he goes ahead and tells you. And... um. Let me see. Right here. But let none but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And this word busybody actually has the same word in it in the Greek as a bishop. A bishop of another. He's saying you're not going to rule over people. And he says that he says that outright in 1 Peter chapter 5 here. He says Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being unsamples to the flock. Example. That word in samples is just an old way of saying example. Not lording over it, like Jesus said in Mark 10, exercising lordship, exercising authority. In um, Mark 10, verses 42 through 45, Jesus says that. You're not going to lord over God's heritage. God is going to lord over his heritage, like all those other verses I read you. And then right here in Acts, they're being tried, Acts 4, verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Yeah, I, we're not worshiping you, we're worshiping God. And then um, in verse, I have 529. Oh yeah, so 529 right here. They say, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So, and they even say that they left rejoicing because they were able to be persecuted. They were happy about it. That's what Christians are supposed to do. And they departed from, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And that's what it actually said over there in 1 Peter. Over here in um, 1 Peter, it actually said, it, like when he says about not ruling over it, the people under you are the people that you cater to. He actually is saying that in the context of like, we're going to go through fiery trials and they're going to try you. And they don't do don't think that that's a strange thing, but rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering. Christ's suffering. That's what he says over here in in Romans In Romans. He says, he says that um, he, he's talking about how suffering with Christ. He says, um, let me see, sorry, I'm looking for it. Um, he actually says, heirs, I'm looking for the word heirs and um, I know it's right here in front of me. I, okay, so right here in verse 17, he says, 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And that they persecute us because we won't follow their rules, like it said over there in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 that I just read to you. So um, because we won't follow follow their rules, they persecute us. And then in, um, here in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, he says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And then in Malachi, verse 6, God says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priest that despise my name, and ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? So he's saying that I am your master. I am your father. And then right here in Hosea 13, he says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou hast of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princes? I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. God says in Hosea 13, verse 9. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 10, verse 7. For to thee doth it pertain, oh, <laughs> for to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee, but they are altogether brutish and foolish, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. And right here in Ecclesiastes 12 verse, or sorry, in Ecclesiastes verse, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 20, it says, Curse not the king, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a spy, a bird of the air, shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Because people are going to go back to that um, busy body, they're busy bodying and they're superintending other people's affairs and running around telling things and they're going back to their, the person that they think is king and trying to pass it through them and they're saying, nah, leave that guy alone. He's um, in a cult. We've seen how that works. If you're a believer, you know how that works. So, okay, that's just a few verses on that subject right there. So, the mark of someone that someone serves right here in the index volume of um, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, we have, um, we're going to get into the ex explaining what the mark of the beast is. So we have um, character. That's where we, that's the, our word character. It's the exact same right there. Character. And then right here you have um, karagma, and that's the word mark, as in mark of the beast. So it tells you right here to go to 9, volume 9, page 416, and volume 9, pages 418. So those are right next to each other, so we can see that. So character and karagma, they come from the same word there. So um, if we come over here to that volume, volume 9, and we look it up, um, I'm just going to get into some of the meat potatoes of what I've researched because I don't have a whole lot of time. So this is Karagma, the mark of the beast. So like the Council of Nicaea and King James is an example because he says over here, he explains that it's a mark or a sign or an inscription, anything written, individual character, especially the impressed or imprinted stamp. And you can see that if you want to pause and try to read that. I don't know how well you can see it. But um, particularly right here, I put alarm, 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 forehead, right hand. We read over there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, that you're supposed to put God's law as frontlets in your eyes and as a mark on your hand. So if we look that up one more time real quick, Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And that's what they say about the mark of the beast. So what it's talking about, and what he even explains here, which really blew my mind, is it's especially the imperial stamp to attest the validity of decrees, dogma, the Council of Nicaea of 325, and 
because Constantinople or Constantine was the king and he was head over the state, Rome and church, the, um, the church, not true believers, but what the world calls church. He owned it. He was in charge of it. He put his imperial stamp on the council of Nicaea, the, like I said in Psalm 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, they gather themselves against the Lord and his anointed. That's what um, Adam and Eve did in the garden when they wanted to be gods. God means a magistrate, the pluralist magistrate. They wanted to be like the Most High. And that's the Antichrist little thing he wants to do is be like the Most High. That's what people do when they don't obey God. They have money stamped. Like it said in Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, they have the dollar sign stamped on their foreheads and on their right hand because you can see that they serve money, power, and position. So um, it says right here, um, he, he goes on to say down here, he says, in Revelations 13, 11 through 18, describes the appearance of the second beast, which comes as the false prophet of the first beast, demanding religious recognition of its cultic image, the other Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says there's another spirit, another Jesus, another gospel. The incident gains its in dramatic force as this image itself comes to life and begins to speak. In verse 15, it demands of all men without exception, and it explained in verse 16 forward there, that the religious totalitarianism of emperor worship is indicated here is evident. It's evident it's talking about emperor worship, like Constantine and like King James. They weren't doing away with the falsities. They were making themselves more powerful. Probably the choice of the word karagma points to this, if the reference to the imperial stamp in line 11 up here, this imperial stamp. That's what this is saying, line 11. Materially, however, the required acceptance of the karagma means religious signing with the mark of the beast, which is branded on the right hand or the forehead. And we see that they already have the brands. It's not an RFID chip or a tattoo. They are serving them more than they serve Yahweh God. They serve these doctrines and decrees that men make up, but they don't serve God. These, um, where was it? Uh, well, anyways, um, I read it to you a moment ago. Um, just... Yeah, right here, these decrees. Oh, yeah, this the imperial stamp to attest the validity of decrees. Dogma. Not God's dogma, his decrees, but man's dogma. So, um, it says, um, yeah, I read that to you. The hand or the forehead, this marking as stigmatization was common in antiquity, as slaves were shown to be their master's property by stigmata, as many people had the marks of deities branded on them in, t in temples. So, and that's, the Bible says if a slave wants to stay with his master, they put um, a avo through his ear and into the doorpost, I think. I can't remember exactly how I said it, but it says in Revelation 13, 18, the mark of the beast is described as the name of the beast. We did a study on the name, the character, or authority. They have the character of the authority concealed in the number 666. Nero is in view. Oh, the emperor Nero? Yes, imperial stamp of his religion is in view. The meaning of the number fits the context best, for in this case there is confrontation between the claim of the emperor and that of the Christ who seal is born by the 144,000 servants of God who belong to him, the completed church. 144,000, 12 times 12, the completed church. The fact that this political-religious clash is meant may be seen from other passages in Revelation which refer back to 1316. The angel in 14, 9, and 11 threatens with eschatological wrath all those who have accepted the karagma of the beast. The execution of this threat is described in 16.2 and the judgment on the beast and his false prophet in 19.20, while in 24, all those who have not worshipped the beast or his image nor accepted his marks on the hand or forehead are exalted as eschatological judges. Jesus said, I'll give you thrones. In Acts 17.19, we read in Paul's address on the Areopagus. Karagma is used here in the sense of handiwork. What men 
What men have made cannot be like the divine, but men, as the creatures of God, are his offspring and are thus close to him. What men have made cannot be like the divine. Council of Nicene, King James, stop following man's religion and listen to Yahweh. <laughs> so um, that's Karagma. And then there's a long one here on character. And he's, he's explaining these so the character of a believer is that he obeys God. And that character has the idea of impression, image, impression, coinage type. So it's like if everyone were coins, the mark on them would either be of Satan or of God. If we were just like blank coins, the mark would be you either worship God or you worship Satan. And finally, the coin itself and um, can simply mean money, income. And it talks about stamps for branding marks. And the Bible speaks of people who are sealed through, like with their minds are sealed through with the hot iron. It says vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Fitted is our word, where we get our word carterize, cartizo, and, um, and seals. So a seal, like, a, like that imperial seal. You're either sealed by Satan or you're sealed by Christ. And the Bible says there's only a few who are sealed by Christ. Few shall find the narrow way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. So um, that's what Isaiah said. And that's what Paul says. And he incarnates in us now. So um, he says, let me see. Yeah, right here, this is funny. Bemoans the fact that there are no characters on the human body whereby one can tell the bad from the good. So it's like, who? Where are the believers? And then, which ones are bad? Which ones are good? If if all the believers had a mark, we could just talk to them, right? We wouldn't have to talk to the non-believers. So um, it explains that there's um, distinctiveness of a language or manner of speaking. Um, the the reference to more to style, so like the way that people worship attractive personalities, I put. And the various ways of philosophizing are also described by characters. Finally, character can be distinctiveness in general. The speech of the wise, says a this guy, must express the individuality of things exactly. So, um, and this one is really extensive, so... You can read the rest of it, but um, the the, um, the main point is that we're supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if you're a believer, you're conforming because God has made you that way, as it says in Romans um, chapter 8. It says, um, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we know that um, the image is the mark, the character, right here, the character, and the karagma is the, you have the character, a person who believes will have the name. That's why the Bible says baptizing in the name, because they will be christened by God to the character, and they will be conformed to the character like it says right there, whom he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He will be, he will be acting like Jesus. Paul said, mimic me. That would be a character, right? Take on my character, Paul is saying. Mimic me as I mimic Christ. So he's actually saying, take on Christ's character. So mimic him, he says. Have the marks of a believer, right? The impression is either coming from Satan or God. And that's why the Bible says, like the answer of the tongue and the preparations of the heart and man in Proverbs 16, 1, is from the Lord, Yahweh. Yahweh is controlling people. He's the one who controls Satan. You see from Job chapter 1 and 2, God controls Satan. So the...